you, uh, uh, hello and welcome everyone to this um, this session on uh, cross border data governance. Um, my name is Christopher Decker. I'm a, a fellow at the Oxford Global Society and also a research fellow at the University of Oxford. Uh, my areas of interest are political economy, competition economics, and regulation, and I'm particularly interested in how different governance frameworks and regulations are developed in different parts of the world. Um, by way of background, the Ox this, this session is being convened by the Oxford Global Society, which is a UK-based uh, independent non-political think tank that focuses on selected contemporary issues of global interest and its importance. Uh, its mission is to conduct independent research, to provide independent advice, to engage with the global community, to inform the public on issues of global governments, and to provide a forum for debate and discussion. And this session is very much in line with those ambitions and aims. And I'm, I'm very pleased to be chairing this session today on, on, on uh, cross-border data flows. I should at the outset give thanks to Professor Yik Chan Chin, uh, another member of the Oxford Global Society who conceived of this idea and did much of the organization. So, so thank you, Yik, for that. Thank you. Thank you. Before we launch into it, it might be useful to have a few uh, introductory remarks about um, to sort of frame the discussion and the things we, we want to talk about in over the next hour and a half. And I think if you step back from, from the, the discussion, the background to, to the session is one where there's really an increasing awareness of the fact that data is constantly being collected by a range of entities in a, a range of different ways. And that this data has enormous value and potential, not only commercially, but also for society and for development. But for that potential to be realized, uh, we need entities to be willing to share the data and countries to be willing to share data and accept data uh, that they have amassed with other parties. It's also in a context, this discussion also happens in a context where there's concern about concentration of data uh, by particular entities, private entities, but also in countries, which can give them tremendous power. And for some, this reflects a, a sort of missed opportunity. An opportunity. There's an opportunity cost, if you like, of not allowing others to access data who can do new and innovative things with it and could provide wider social benefits. So at the global level, we're seeing increasing recognition that data sharing across borders can provide social benefits and can promote development. However, while there's considerable potential, and many recognize this considerable potential from greater cross-border data sharing, it's currently limited by various factors, and hopefully we'll cover those today. But in general terms, these include things like concerns about privacy and data protection, what happens if data falls into the wrong hands or is misused, even anonymized data, which can be de-identified, national security concerns in some countries, concerns about giving data to giant companies in other countries, tech giants in other countries, or being compelled to give data to governments. Some countries are worried about hold up, traditional ideas of if they give their data off to uh, an entity in another country, will they be beholden to that, to that the entity and to that country in some way? And data sharing is also being limited by private concerns about losing competitive advantage for particular firms, which leads to sort of data hoarding, or at the country level, by countries being concerned about losing their comparative advantage. Uh, they, many countries, many jurisdictions want to be world leaders in digital markets, uh, and this is part of that. But finally, global data sharing is being, I think, impeded by the absence of an international agreement, rules, or some sort of multilateral governance framework. And it's this particular point that we want to discuss and focus on today. And as you can see, we've assembled an outstanding global panel of experts and speakers from all around the world, really, from India, China, the US, and Europe to assist us with our discussion. And what we've, we've asked them to do is really to focus on five points. They may touch them, may not touch them, but these, these are common points that we've asked the speakers to address. And the first point is, what are the considerations that are shaping the rules for cross-border data sharing in their country or region? The second question is, what are the areas of difference between those rules in their country and elsewhere? A third question we've asked is to, to get their views on the feasibility of whether they think it's possible to develop an international uh, approach to cross-border data sharing. What needs to happen to have some sort of uh, rules or convergence or to develop a common approach? What sort of institutional arrangements need to be created to allow us to implement and monitor such an approach? 
And finally, what are the risks of not developing a sort of common international approach to data sharing? Could it lead to a digital divide? So these are the questions that we've asked uh, our speakers to, to address today. So briefly, just to introduce the four speakers before, before we uh, kick off the session, um, our first speaker is going to be Professor Susan Ariel Aronson, who is a research professor and the director of the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub at the George Washington University. The hub maps the governance of personal, public and proprietary data around the world and examines how it affects data-driven tech, uh, human autonomy and human rights. So welcome, um, Professor Aronson. Professor Miraburi will be speaking next, and she is a professor of international economic and internet law at the Faculty of Law of the University of Lucerne in Switzerland, where she teaches international intellectual property law, media, internet, and trade law. Miri is the principal investigator of the project Trade Law 4.0 uh, under a European research uh, grant, and she also consults with the European Parliament, UNESCO, and others on the issues of digital innovation. Following uh, Professor uh, Buri will be Professor Yik Chan Chin, who is an associate professor at the School of Journalism and Communication at uh, Beijing Normal University. She teaches cyberspace governance, digital media law and ethics, and she participates in the UN's open-ended working group on developments in the field of information and telecommunications. And our final speaker will be Dr. Manzi Kedia, who is a senior fellow at the Indian Council for Research on International Economic Relations, her areas of research include digital and telecommunications policy, tax, and industrial policy. And she was appointed a member of the task force for rewriting the direct tax code in India, and is currently a mid-career fellow of the Internet Society. So we've asked each speaker to, uh, to present for about 12 to 15 minutes, and after the presentations, we're hoping to have a discussion for around 20 to 30 minutes, in which, in which time you'll be able to answer questions. But if you have any questions, please put them in the chat box as, as you listen to the speakers. So with all that said, I now pass over to uh, Professor uh, Aronson to give her presentation. Thank you. Uh, uh, Professor Aronson, you're on mute, I think. I think. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so, as in, I've only done this three million times in the past three years, right? You'd think I know how to do it. Well, thank you so much. Um, I won't take that long, but. Um, uh, I want to just reiterate how honored I am to share uh, this presentation and discussion with you, the audience, and these distinguished speakers. So what I'd like to do today is talk a bit. I'm just going to begin by saying that the United States is a mess. And um, we, our digital trade template is outdated and going nowhere. And the reason for that is there's no demand for it. Right. It's just not a priority. Why? Because the United States is sort of captured by I'm going to call them nationalists because I think people misuse the word populist. And um, as a result, the Biden administration very much wants to show that it's rethinking trade policy to address the needs of workers who have been affected by it. It's very much colored by national security concerns and fears about uh, one particular country's authoritarianism and competitiveness in data-driven sectors. Um, so Congress has not demanded it. There is no fast-track trade promotion authority. Um, so the United States is trying to cooperate with other countries through the Te Trade and Technology Council, as example. Okay, but there is no supply. And another thing that might explain this is that the United States is to some extent <laughs> captured by its data giants. So there aren't really original ideas. Meanwhile, there is what Jagdish Bhagwati called <laughs> the spaghetti ball or the noodle ball. And I think this perception is really uh, more about the fact that many countries don't understand data 
And there's very little attempt at collaborative approaches as Mira's database and my own show. Uh, yes, there is the free flow of data with exceptions. So, but beyond that, there's some significant differences. And so let's talk about data. And just, um, it really isn't the same thing as other things, goods and services that are traded across borders, right? Because data is really easy and cheap and to move, right? It's easy to share and reuse, but it is increasingly hoarded by governments and firms. Data can also be simultaneously a commercial asset and a public good, right? But no trade agreement mentions that dual nature. Um, it's essential to national security and economic growth, and it's the foundation of a wide range of services, yet nobody really knows how to govern it. And that's what uh, the Digital Trade and Data Governance Hub tries to look at, is any we don't know what right looks like, but we do know that there are many different approaches and what can we learn from those approaches? Okay, going more into detail into most digital trade agreements, I'm not gonna focus on what they do do, I'm gonna focus on what they don't do. Hope that's okay. So they don't really discuss the very issues that undermine trust. In 1997, the Clinton administration basically said, we're going to need to have some common ground to have the free flow of data. And they said, if we're going to do that, trust is essential. Yet they don't look at the very issues that people say when they're surveyed, if you believe in surveys, um, undermine trust, right? And what are those things? Well, when India shuts off the internet or um, malware or cross-border disinformation or online harassment. Some of those things don't really belong in trade agreements, but others could. They could be provisions, and those could address trust. Trade agreements also don't discuss data as both a commercial asset and a public good. Um, and as Christopher said, the importance of sharing. They don't address the need for data governance capacity building, which is why so many countries, you know, they don't, just as they pay rents on intellectual property, um, they're pretty angry if they don't have data-driven services that they'll have to import those in order to export commodities. And so we uh, should be helping these countries develop the capacity to govern data. They don't address information asymmetries. That's another aspect of that point. I'm going to go into that a little bit more and how that can hamper uh, competition and innovation, right? The data-driven economy is uh, very much um, dominated by firms in two countries. They don't really anticipate what new data-driven technologies may need. And I, I just cite virtual reality extended reality, mixed reality, augmented reality as an example, which is going to require new ways of thinking about jurisdiction and property rights. And then they don't address new types of barriers. And I'm going to talk about that too in a second. So thanks for your patience. So regarding information asymmetries, are there data cartels? So here's what I'm talking about. Obviously, firms that have more computing power, and who are those firms? They're WeChat and Google and Meta. Those firms have more computing power and they're better positioned to extract and use data. And those firms in turn are better positioned to exploit big data sets. Oh my God, I misspelled sets. Um, they have more data, they hoard it. They have, so they can create more goods and services. And this phenomenon also applies across country, right? Um, so uh, UNCTAD has reported that there are 70 large data platforms and they tend to be concentrated in middle income and wealthy countries and in particular two countries. And we all know who, which countries those are, US and China. So are these essentially data cartels? Something to think about. Okay, it also doesn't address future barriers. So what am I talking about here? 
All right. So one potential barrier could be data sharing rules. Why is that a potential barrier? Well, current EU law could be seen, I'm not saying it is, as violating most favored nation or national treatment. Um, I want to give you another one. Apple has a privacy label, which means that firm, you know, it's it's very opaque about firms that it thinks don't deserve to uh, be in its store and um, it labels them. I, I'm not an Apple person, so I've actually not experienced this. So I'm probably not the best person to talk about it, but it's just like a social label, right? It could violate MFN and like product. Another one, censorship, right? When you turn off the internet or when you censor a firm, you are violating market access. And in turn, you know, uh, it can affect internet stability. So that could be a future trade barrier. So I just wanted to give some examples to get you thinking. This table has some more and I can, you know, share it again later. Okay. And then finally, it doesn't meet the challenges of new technologies. Now, an unwritten law of trade agreements is that they should be technologically neutral. But I also think they should be anticipatory and thoughtful. Well, let me give you an example. Let's talk about artificial intelligence. So the global market for AI is huge and growing. And AI, uh, people, the holy grail is to make it a general purpose technology, right? So uh, most people are very unaware that they use AI every day in everything from spell check to their schoolwork to how they find their future mates. And two countries dominate the AI market um, and AI funding and AI research. And we know what those two countries are. Um, my own country is um, losing some comparative advantage in that area, uh, while countries such as Canada are, are gaining. But um, basically still, though, the largest firms dominate. And it's very interesting. Uh, these firms often rely on open source methods for their algorithms, but generally use trade secrets to protect um, their data and their algorithms, and most importantly, to control the data that they analyzed. And we can talk about that a little bit more later. And in my mind, that dominance leads to a perception that AI markets are unfair. And around the world, we see governments subsidizing the development of AI and starting to put in place what I would call AI protectionism. Um, so let me give you an example of that. Um, it may make it harder to set standards for ethical or trustworthy AI, which is the big fashion now. And trustworthy AI essentially means uh, that you abide by a set of standards in designing, developing, deploying AI. And uh, that, you know, again, could be a form of social labeling, okay, um, which could lead, you know, be perceived as a barrier, even though it has a noble purpose. Another thing that current rules don't address is that they don't advance data sharing among societal entities. And to me, that is a public good, a global public good, because such data sharing could have solve wicked problems that cross borders and transcend generations. Um, I condemn them because they do not incentivize shared approaches. They have all sorts of groovy language like, I always find this language very odd. Uh, government should endeavor to cooperate, <laughs> but that doesn't mean they should cooperate. And if they did cooperate, um, that might um, have real important effects internationally. Um, there's no um, encouraging of data sharing between governments and, excuse me, the private sector and governments. It's all a one-way street from, you know, governments are, put, are supposed to put their data in machine readable format, but there aren't the similar rules for the private sector to share data with others. 
So it's kind of weird. And I just think we need to think, you know, is this template the best template? Is this the best that we can do? It may be the best that we can agree at. So this is uh, the research that we do. It's called the Global Data Governance Mapping Project, and it maps what governments are doing for uh, everything from we start with strategies, we move to laws and regulations, then we go to governance structures, but we also look at the foundations of trust in governance. So, for example, um, does the public participate in the development of these policies. We, that's our latest research. Um, and so check it out. You like my marketing skills. And thank you so much for hearing me out. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Anderson. It was very, very interesting um, to get a sense of what's happening, well, what's not happening in the US uh, and your reflections on the challenges. Um, we're going to go now to uh, Lucerne and uh, Professor Vuri will now give a presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. Um, I'm delighted to join you in this conversation today. So uh, my goal would be to talk about the position of the European Union in this landscape of free trade agreements, in particular regulating uh, data flows and um, uh, privacy protection. And as Chris mentioned in the beginning, um, in order to somehow understand this, it's a, the backdrop is quite important. And there is a technological, geopolitical um, and regulatory context that um, I'll briefly talk about in order to, to see how the EU's position has also evolved uh, over time. So as Chris also mentioned, of course, the starting point of all these discussions is sort of the centrality of data for contemporary economies, but indeed also for contemporary societies as a whole. Um, and although, of course, this is what the economist said is somewhat a flawed statement because data is not necessarily exhaustible and its value may be uh, lost over time, uh, this is still an important statement to show that in the discussions of the regulation of electronic commerce as we used to know it, we have now moved towards the regulation of the data-driven economy. So the scope actually of this uh, regulation um, has increased over time. And governments have, of course, struggled to formulate new types of trade policies that can reflect uh, these new practices that we have. Uh, including, of course, taking into account the growing importance of um, data. Uh, why isn't it so easy to regulate uh, uh, data through trade agreements? On the one hand, that was pointed out, data must cross uh, borders in order to, to have a living data-driven economy, in order to have digital innovation and growth. On the other hand, there are certain challenges, of course, that come with this uh, on the one hand, um, um, it is just not very easy when data leaves the country to a certain jurisdiction and also to also make sure that, you know, the, the interests, the values and the rights of the citizenry in that country uh, are properly protected for the European Union. This has been, of course, uh, the major preoccupation has been with the protection of uh, privacy. But there are also, of course, uh, other issues. And if you want to look at this rise of digital protectionism, there is a very interesting new report on unilateral measures that essentially lead to uh, digital fragmentation. And you see here the link uh, down on uh, the slide. Um, what is perhaps um, important to mention with regard particularly to uh, privacy protection is that this data, this new data economy and big data analytics in particular, they have indeed uh, put certain challenges between uh, before privacy regulation. And uh, I have listed some of those. Um, Chris mentioned some of those that we don't have this distinction with it, between personal and non-personal data. Re-identification is easy. And a lot of the sort of old fashioned um, data protection laws that we have had around the world, including in the European Union, was simply not look, uh, working properly uh, in this new environment. And I'm going to come back to this uh, later on uh, if, if you wish. 
Uh, now, as uh, was mentioned before also by, by Susan, uh, we have a very dynamic uh, landscape for the regulation of data flows and now also data protection in free trade agreements, in preferential trade agreements. And um, we have a great number of such agreements and essentially all the recent agreements that we have have dedicated rules on digital trade, including rules on data flows and uh, privacy protection. Still the number of agreements, if you compare the ratio of those agreements having rules on data flows and the rest of uh, the FTAs is not huge. It's not a, a huge number of trees. What is particularly important, and maybe I, I would disagree here a little bit with Susan, is that over the years, states have developed certain templates to address uh, digital trade. So we have uh, a positioning of the stakeholders. And I think the United States, um, maybe not now proactively involved in this sort of uh, further development of the templates, but there is still something there. And it all started really with um, uh, the CPTPP with this um, agreement that we have uh, between 11 countries uh, in the Pacific Rim, which was, however, very much influenced by the United States in the negotiations that led to this agreement. And what we see here uh, is a very liberal approach uh, towards digital trade, towards data flows, which is also somehow combined with the relatively low standards of privacy protection. So the CPTPP and later on also the updated NAFTA, the USMCA, they basically say that anything goes and even voluntary schemes are uh, sufficient to provide somehow interoperability between uh, the different parties uh, as part of those uh, treaties. Uh, the reason I mentioned this CPTPP model and uh, for you to understand perhaps a little bit the landscape is that this model has indeed diffused. So we see very clearly that a lot of other countries have replicated uh, this particular approach towards digital trade, and, and including uh, the free flow of data and a ban on data localization measures. So we do have a great number of agreements that follow this approach. And on top of that, however, um, as Susan mentioned, maybe not the best way to go forward, but we have seen some strands of legal uh, innovation in the digital economy agreements, which have now become sort of the latest trend in this digital trade uh, landscape with uh, the UK-Singapore Digital Economy Agreement being the last one. And here, what is perhaps interesting to point out for the regulatory, for the trade experts is that uh, not all of them are necessarily linked to a trade agreement. So the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement between Chile and New Zealand and Singapore is not. However, the rest are really part sort of as a, a trade deal. And this, of course, has implications for the enforceability of these different types of agreements. So we can see the EU approach as a reaction a little bit uh, to this uh, evolving regulatory landscape and uh, also a little bit as trying to safeguard its own values in this regulatory landscape. Here it is interesting to see uh, the evolution of the EU position over time. So if you look at the entire sort of set of free trade agreements that the EU has, and there are quite a number of those, um, the early agreements are very cautious. So in a sense, the EU has been really a late mover into this sort of new dynamic of digital trade rulemaking. Um, if you look at agreements with uh, Chile, uh, with South Korea, and others, they don't have anything on digital trade or very, very few soft law cooperation type of provisions. Even the agreement with uh, Canada, the one from 2016, uh, from 2017, has very little in it. I mean, there, there are certain uh, soft rules to try to pr uh, uh, promote pr transparency, to protect privacy, but those are soft things. and. There is really nothing on, on data flows. And this changed a little bit or started to change with um, the EU-Japan agreement and the updated of the EU-Mexico global agreement, where basically there was a placeholder for the parties to reassess the situation and agree on provisions on data flows later on. Now the EU uh, also, as Susan pointed out, 
does have a template. And it's a relatively clear template that for the first time sort of replicate some of the US-like CPTPP-like provisions. You know, they say, well, we agree, we're gonna have a ban on data localization measures with certain exceptions. We're gonna have also uh, basically commit to the free flow of data, yet those must be coupled with the high standards of data protection coming basically from the EU uh, general data protection regulation and endorsing privacy as a fundamental right. So this is also the treaty language you're gonna see in the FTAs, basically saying privacy is a fundamental right. And um, you're gonna see here the language which I have extracted from the currently negotiated uh, trade deals that the EU has uh, with Australia and Tunisia and the recently adopted um, agreement with New Zealand. They say, well, privacy is a fundamental right. We would like to have very robust data protection at home. And this must all, might also include some sort of a limitation to the cross-border transfer of data. On top of that, we have this really broad carve out that the EU re really likes in order to protect its policy space, where it says, well, you know, we can regulate in any situation if we wish to achieve a legitimate policy objective, including a great number of public policy objectives uh, and uh, uh, privacy and data protection um, in particular. So we have this approach, which as I mentioned before, is now confirmed in the agreement with, the e with New Zealand, as well as the post-Brexit trade and cooperation agreement with the United uh, Kingdom. Um, it is very clear that um, the EU is sort of exporting, in a sense, its rules, uh, you know, this sort of very robust data protection that it has at home through the GDPR. And this is doing this not only through the channel of free trade agreements, but also through other channels as well. This includes, on the one hand, a sort of an extraterritorial effect of the GDPR itself. Um, as you know, basically targeting uh, also uh, companies, um, actors that are not necessarily headquartered in the EU, but might in some way process EU citizens' data. And another way of sort of exerting this Brussels effect, as it's called, um, is through the adequacy decision which the EU adopts with individual states around the world, which have to provide an equivalent level of data protection in their own territories. And we have this agreement with the UK, Japan, and others. And the EU is really pushing for more of those um, adequacy decisions. Now, very recently, starting maybe um, this year, uh, the EU has really tried to, to go on this sovereignty building channel, uh, I would say, in the data-driven economy. And they define it very broadly. They talk not only about uh, digital sovereignty, they talk about data sovereignty and technological sovereignty, which all of those, of course, are uh, uh, coupled with uh, the very robust regulation of the digital economy that the EU adopts at home, uh, basically the standards and benchmarks through the Digital Services Act um, and others that basically also have a sort of an extraterritorial effect, this wish to protect, you know, or um, EU citizens' rights and capture also these big tech companies, which are not necessarily, of course, um, EU-based. Maybe just as a side note, it's interesting to see uh, the UK, because this is an Oxford-based seminar, to basically men mention that the UK might be moving away a little bit from this model, and it's doing this now in, in recent times quite proactively. So there might be some tension um, with the EU going forward, uh, if one looks, of course, at the terms that we have coming from the trade and cooperation agreement and the acquisition decision, which might be not might not be satisfied if the UK is really pushing uh, through this sort of uh, more liberal approach, very much in the model of the CPTPP and um, uh, the US MCA, basically the US model. So we have this uh, uh, really contrast between um, the EU uh, and the United States and all the other countries where the model has diffused, of course. And um, I haven't listed uh, here China or India, but the EU is in a way um, 
similar to China because it has a conditional approach to data flows, but of course, very different in the justification that it gives uh, to this conditional approach to, to data flows. And um, some of this justification for the year approach simply comes from its very uh, culturally embedded uh, and legally embedded perception of how privacy should be protected. So um, it's not um, somehow, it's a, it's a relatively, uh, it's a translation of what the EU is doing at home and its international um, uh, framework. Uh, maybe just um, to address very briefly some of the questions that Chris has posed to us uh, in the very beginning of this webinar. Uh, what is what what's to expect next? What we will be seeing next? Um, I, I I think I mean uh, being a, a pragmatic uh, observer that um, I, the most likely scenario is sort of preserving the status quo, and we're going to see an increased con uh, contestation between these different models that we have: uh, U.S. plus um, uh, the EU with the Brussels effect uh, and. China and other uh, countries without finding really a common solution on the, uh, the w WTO forum or elsewhere. And really this topic of data sovereignty, which I'm not necessarily a fan of, I must say, will become more important and countries are gonna do more and more things to protect this data, digital slash technological sovereignty. There have been some suggestions, of course, in the literature and policy that this is not uh, the way forward. This is not the right way uh, where you know we should uh, really work, regulate the data-driven economy. And there have been some suggestions to move towards a global privacy enforcement treaty, um, a suggestion that has been endorsed by, by Anupam Chanda and Paul Schwartz. They basically suggest two things. One that goes on more of the procedural side of things, with the um, strengthening the accountability mechanisms in the sense of uh, basically making a global privacy shield type of agreement. And the other one, which is, I think, rather um, unlikely is to agree substantively on what the rules on personal data protection should be and move towards a global uh, agreement on privacy. Um, I'll stop here. Um, I, I couldn't see the time and couldn't follow the time, but I'll be very happy later on uh, to engage in the discussions and address some uh, questions. Thank you so much. So much, Mira. That was that was really excellent, uh, an excellent overview of what's what's happening in the EU and also all these trade agreements that are emerging in different parts. Um, okay, over to. Uh, Professor Yik Chan Shin now, who's going to talk about uh, the Chinese perspective. Sorry, I have to unmute myself first. So, can you hear me? Yes, perfectly. Okay, thank you. So, uh, my uh, actually my presentation is following the um, uh, Chris's three que uh, five questions. So it's uh, it is actually I'm trying to attempt to answer the questions posed by Chris. So the first one uh, is about uh, the the features of China's uh, uh, the rules on global uh, on governing the transporter flows. So basically, in, in the the governance of the cross border flow in in China is uh, closely tied to the three elements. One is the sovereignty, one is uh, as many already, as my previous speaker already mentioned. So it's about national sovereignty and uh, also national security and the personal data protection. So those three elements, which actually shaped China's governance of the course border flow. And then on the other hand, uh, they also categorized uh, the data and the, uh, according to different uh, purpose and the different natures. So there are seven categories of course about data flow and also different uh, local storage requirements. So I will touch this later on. So in terms of the FTAs, China has uh, already China uh, Australia FTA, but it's also joined the RCEP and uh, they are applying for the CPTTP and the DEPA. Uh, so 
what are the differences of the difference and the divergence you can see between the uh, three countries? I mean, EU, China, and India. So, uh, so before I go to the difference, I would like to point out why there are differences. Because basically, it reflects their commercial interests and their regulatory approach between those different uh, three uh, regions or countries. So for the US, they are more the 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 the, the entry, that commercial interest is uh, to protect the digital service oriented firm. And also because if you look at the uh, US regulatory model is more about a permiss legal framework, which means they minimize state intervention in government regulate the uh, the market. And uh, if you look at China, China is uh, uh, actually a major e-commerce form of trading physical goods. So, so therefore, they focus on traditional goods rather than the uh, uh, the e-commerce. Uh, sorry, rather than the data. And uh, so, therefore, they have a different uh, interests. And also, uh, China's regulatory approach is subject to having the state legal regulation, regulation, also coal and self regulations. So, which is different from the US. And where the EU. As uh, they are more emphasized on the traditional of the human rights protection, and also there are no major digital platforms, you know, uh, dominating in the global e-commerce market. And uh, on top on top of that, there are lack of the strong central governments to override security issues because without the EU, that's a uh, no central governments, you know, to concern the, the, the whole security issues. So those three different reasons that's why contribute to different approach. And so I will skip this part because uh, that's all uh, quickly. Because the, if you look at the the, uh, the American style in terms of the free trade systems, so uh, they are more emphasized on individual and consumers' rights in digital products, and also have a very restrictive role for the governments to control over the flow of data. So the TPP is the first one uh, imposed a binding uh, provision in terms of how uh, in terms of the, of the free flow of information to make it a free flow of information as a binding norms. And the TPP uh, actually was uh, preserved in other FTAs like a CPTTP and the also US and Mexico Canada agreements. But on the other hand, they also talk about the privacy because if we look at the U.S. submission to the WTO uh, uh, committee and they mentioned about privacy, they said privacy is a matter that is least trade restrictive, allow trade to flourish, will preserve the legitimate public policy objective. They agree that so we need to protect, we need to protect uh, privacy, but they want to have a less trade restrictive effect. So if you look at the uh, EU's approach, as uh, uh, Mira just uh, mentioned, uh, actually they use the adequacy decision, you know, to restrict uh, uh, the free flow of the information outside of the EU. And also they, uh, just we, 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 she mentioned, they have uh, this uh, uh, right to take and maintain personal data measure as they deem the appropriate. So actually deem the appropriate is given a lot, uh, quite a broad uh, Discretions, you know, to the EU as a regulator uh, to uh, impose the regulation on the cross-border flows, and uh, and they have more strong language and data protection in the future regional agreements. So, if given the uh, intrusive rules in the GDPP, GDPR, sorry. So, if you look at the China's approach, actually, it is it's interesting because. Uh, Actually, if you look at the details, you know, the uh, uh, regulatory provisions, there are very few cases in China where the export of the data is completely a habit. And the majority of the data can be legally exported after meeting the requirements such as a security assessment, security certificate, or standard contract and extra and the extras. And the, the, the latest the data security uh, assessment measure actually provide some legal certainty by defining four categories of personal and important data that are required to uh, do the security assessment. So, and if you look at the, those the uh, requirement, uh, security requirement, you found actually, uh, this is the formulation is quite a more detailed really reference to the provision of the national uh, security exceptions in many FTAs. Because in many FTAs, they also have a national security uh, exceptions. And uh, if you look at the China's data export security assessment measures, they have a similarity between these two measures. 
and also they also put like legality, legitimacy, and necessity as a test. Okay, in the the restrictions, which actually in line with the uh, personal information protection law. So here, uh, look at the the different uh, uh, FTA. We found uh, when China joined the RCEP, and uh, they agree the default should be the free flow of data, not force the data localization. But they want to have a border potential border exception provisions. So, and uh, the DPP actually afford like a public interest and the security exceptions. Okay, but they have to pass a very strict test. For example, purposive limitation and the necessity text. So, and uh, I would like to say that uh, China's cross-border rules will uh, inevitably affect the direction of international cross-border rules. So therefore, engage with them is quite important. So if you look at the developing country like India, I think they have a different, uh, not a, a different uh, 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 demand or needs. For example, they want to protect the right to development and maintain the industrial autonomies because unlike the US, China, you know, and they are more uh, lack of the digital capacity and also there's a digital divide. So therefore, and they also have a national security interest concerned. So therefore for them, they're more concerned about the right to development and I mean, industry autonomy. I think that's uh, the, the, the differences between those uh, regions and the countries. So how flexible is the idea to developing a common international approach uh, to cause about that data flow? Uh, what do we think we need to happen to enable some convergence to uh, in order to develop a common approach? So I think that for, um, from my personal point of view, there's some uh, challenge of the global standard setting. So many people propose a solution, you know, there's a divergence of how can we uh, reconcile or resolve this divergence. So there's a kind of the, like a capacity, compa compa compatibility mechanism. So there's a different compatibility mechanism. And uh, one of the uh, mechanism is to establish regional interoperability mechanisms such as the trans data privacy framework or the uh, CBPR. And uh, but the main concern of this is that many of those uh, uh, mechanisms are actually still in light, you know, aligned with the composition of geopolitical power and also with the existing trade block. So they are not able to solve the fundamental problem of establishing an international regulatory framework. So that's a problem. Even they have this interoperability mechanism, but still they are still in line, aligned with the geopolitical power and the uh, trade blocks. And the other issue is uh, also the national security issues. I think uh, many people already touched it, you know, and uh, the national security issues come, become a very uh, dominant narratives in, the, in both the domestic law and also in the uh, FTAs, not only by China, but also by US and the EU. So, uh, so, uh, so then the next, uh, next move, next question is, uh, what is the possible, is there any possibility to establish an uh, international standard? Uh, so there's a role of the WTO in, in defining international rules in data flows. So, uh, as I said, you know, the, in, uh, the, but it's very difficult to, uh, to, because the uh, negotiation, uh, negotiation in the WTO is very slow. So, uh, so, uh, the first of all, for establishing international regulatory or cross border flow, we need to resolve the problem of consensus. So it's not all, it's not really about a data localization or national security, because this is still is subject to the sovereign state's policy choice. But fundamentally, it's more about to solve the problem of consensus. That is, what model, what scope, and what path. Of course, what data flow can be generally agreed by different countries, and how to find a dedicated balance among the uh, cross-border data and also the legitimate public goals of various state and also individual digital rights, as Susan just mentioned, you know, and in a contextualized, inclusive, and proportional and tier made uh, manner. So this is a problem if we want to uh, establish uh, international rules in data flow. So uh, WTO has a, uh, has a kind of role to play, you know, uh, even the, the progress is very slow. Uh, one one um, recently, uh, recent progress 
next is the negotiation under the joint statement initiative under e-commerce. So which is uh, uh, backed by 76 WTO members. So in, uh, and the 86, mem 86 WTO members already, you know, joined uh, the development, uh, participate in this negotiation. So they want to seek the speediest progress in, negotiate, uh, in negotiation, including on the key issue of data flow and the lo data localization. And uh, on top of that, they also, uh, have this kind of e-commerce capacity building framework, which helped the developing country and less developed country to build up their capacity. So uh, wh whether they can achieve a thin agreement, uh, is we still have to wait to see, you know. Um, but that's a, we can see that's a, is, is a progress at WTO. So what institution arrangement do you do we think uh, do I think would need to create a, uh, to monitor and implement such a common approach? So I think that first of all, it's about the national security and the public policy exceptions. If you look at all these FTAs, even WTO negotiation, there's a uh, there's a narratives of national security exceptions. So therefore, you know, uh, we, we can see there's a tendency countries increasingly adopt a very broad understanding of national security, which is beyond the traditional definition, such as a military uh, threat or the non, uh, and to include such as the non-traditional concerns such as poverty, trade, economy, human rights, and environmental security. So this is what we call the securitization of the industry policy. So therefore, uh, first of all, in order to uh, build up a consensus, uh, uh, there's a need to draw in a rational distinction between the legitimate security measure from the other legitimate non-security measure. So this is the first uh, uh, thing we need to address. And the second is, uh, so how can we address that? So first of all, we need to understand uh, how the change you know, of the understanding of the uh, trade and the security at the national level, which clash with the global economic governance, because at a different national level, they have a different perception about the relationship between trade and security. In China, in U U uh, EU and the US, they all have a national security concern. So how this different understanding between the trade and security uh, clash with the global economic governance? I think that's the uh, uh, one problem when you look at. And the, and the second is a relationship between the notion of cyber security, data governance, and the international trade law, and needs to be clarified. And uh, thirdly, is uh, whether we need an uh, innovation, you know, in conceptualized the, the national and the, uh, and the also international operation of security. And the thirdly, we need uh, some institutional mechanism to reconcile, you know, the security issue with the trade obligations. So this is in. Uh, institutional mechanism can be a trade rules, judicial reviews, cyber democracy, or the international regulatory cooperation, or even the WTO as a venue. So if you look at WTO uh, mechanism, because this is uh, I'm uh, focus, focusing on. So uh, at the moment, you know, uh, WTO, they, uh, they still need a binding mechanism to enforce the rules and uh, resolve the dispute. And uh, but uh, there's an issue about uh, WTO's dispute uh, panels because the U.S. has blocked, you know, the high, uh, the hire of the new judge uh, of the WTO's uh, dispute panels. So this is uh, one of the obstacle. The second obstacle is also about uh, whether there's a uh, there's a consensus that WTO needs to reform, you know, and to provide a less condition to. Um, kind of to, to uh, facilitate the three larger economy like China, EU and China and, uh, and the US to address the trade tensions because without the cooperation between the China and the, and the uh, US, it's very difficult to reach any trade agreements under the WTO mechanisms. So there's a uh, urge of the reforming of WTO. So what are the risks of not developing a common international approach? And uh, so there's a several risk. Uh, first of all, is, of course, is increase the transition cost and the risk for the business sectors, you know, because without uh, the common uh, uh, common framework, if just uh, between the bilateral agreements or regional agreements or even uh, the uh, the country 
between country to country, between company to company, which will increase the transitional cost and the risk for the business sectors. And secondly, the FTA is actually is not to set up the international ground uh, common framework, but mainly is strengthen the interdependence and the trust of country involved in that regional trade block. So we can see there's a divisions, you know, uh, country partici participate in the particular FTA, they will strengthen their inter interdependence trust, but um, excluded others. So this will uh, produce the kind of exclusion effect and also digital divide of fragmentations. And especially for a large number of the developing countries that are not integrated into the global trade system. And the more, and the lastly is the perpetuate the geopolitical and the technological world, because we can see a lot of the problem we are facing is the result of the geopolitical and the technological decoupling or cold world. And if we cannot resolve the global uh, the government, global governance of the data flow, it will probably could perpetuate, you know, this kind of a cold war or the divisions or the we kind of decoupling. Yeah, I think that's all. I yeah for my for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Yik, for for that presentation. That was excellent. Um, our final speaker now is uh, Dr. Manzi Kedia from India, and over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Decker. Just a moment, I'll quickly share my screen. I hope this is visible. Yes, that's fine. Thank you, Thank you so much. Uh, let me begin by thanking you and Dr. Chin and Oxford Global Society for inviting me to this uh, really wonderful panel discussion. I'm uh, I've, I've gained a lot from listening to everyone that spoke before me and also providing me a perspective uh, that I think that I, I knew, but I'm seeing some really new ideas. Uh, and a lot of what I was going to say uh, has already been said. So I'll skip over those and try to really focus on where we are in India and uh, how uh, India is, is not unique, I'd say, but still navigating on what it wants to do with uh, cross-border data governance. I don't think that uh, they have a position and they have, um, but uh, they seem to still be figuring out uh, to what extent and how to sort of navigate it. Uh, so I'm going to uh, cover India's current position on cross-border flow of data and how we got here. Uh, some evidence on what the economic costs of data localization are and how different industries have been impacted by that and how that may or may not influence the government's decision on uh, policies and regulations and some discussion on the way forward. Um, very quickly, uh, just to set context, what are uh, where are we, uh, you know, in terms of what does data flows really mean for India? And a lot of studies, and here I highlight one, uh, where uh, the Hinrich Foundation uh, estimated that digital trade, including cross-border data flows and several other types of uh, digital trade, uh, several other components of digital trade, contributed really $35 billion in 2019 and to become $512 billion by 2030. What this is accompanied by is data on how traffic or internet traffic in India is largely driven by firms that are based in the United States and that most of the data that is generated by internet use in India is actually stored outside India. The other important fact I think is that queries related to cyber crime and data requests uh, raised by law enforcement agencies in India, 845 of them in 2021 were still pending under uh, what we call the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, the international framework that is available for coordination and resolution of uh, cybercrime, um, as well as uh, some independent queries raised with foreign courts. Uh, what this has led to that of the 62 countries that have a total of 144 data localization regulations, this is a number I'm, I've picked up from another report uh, and I'm I'm going to admit that I haven't verified this, but let's say about these numbers, 62 countries, 144 data localization regulations. As of 2021, India had the second highest number of restrictions behind China, which uh, Professor Yin just spoke about how uh, they, I mean, despite 
these exceptions, uh, China seems to be fairly firm on how it wants to allow export of data and uh, free flow. And in India, the sectors that see data localization regulations are largely related to telecom subscriber data, financial services quite extensively, uh, on cloud services that are provided to the government, uh, company accounts, and other forms of public data that are collected by the government. Uh, just to reiterate the strong position that India has on digital sovereignty and wanting some control over the data and over uh, just the digital economy that is currently evolving in India. In multilateral agreements, and everyone's covered this, but just to sort of confirm India's position, we've we haven't, we didn't sign the uh, Osaka track, Japan's proposal on data free flow with trust in 2019, uh, along with South Africa and Indonesia. We were uh, the only country that didn't sign and there were other countries, other developing countries such as Brazil, South Africa, uh, Brazil, China that uh, did uh, go along uh, with with the G20 to cooperate uh, on um, arriving at a global framework for uh, data free flow, but uh, India, India abstained from it. And similarly on uh, the WTO's joint initiative that uh, Dr. Chin spoke about so eloquently, uh, India, I mean, is, is opposing and finding um, ways to stay away from that discussion on, on different grounds. On the bilateral agreements, uh, however, there seems to be um, slightly a slight loosening of that stance, and there is at least some discussion on uh, wanting to cooperate and wanting to allow free flow of data. However, there isn't um, a very firm uh, th there isn't a very firm documentation or firm wording in any existing agreement that would put put binding restrictions on Indian and Indian companies to allow free flow of data. So uh, on the US, we don't really have anything. It's sort of a stalemate. There is some discussion uh, going on in the trade policy forum, but um, we don't know what direction it's going to take. There is very loose language in the uh, recently concluded India UAE SEPA. Uh, in the Australia India agreement, we do not uh, have those negotiations recorded on cross border data flows yet, but likely to happen. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that while in multilateral agreements, India has had a much stronger position in terms of not wanting to engage or abstaining from any uh, position that would even suggest that they'd allow for free flow of uh, data, in bilateral agreements, there's a softening of that position. And um, domestically, what is happening is uh, uh, that India currently uh, on, on privacy issues related to data localization, India does not have a privacy bill. For the last five years, we've been trying to negotiate and work on something, uh, What a, a version of what we saw in 2021 that was uh, very much aligned to the GDPR with, with the inclusion of several uh, localization requirements uh, has been junked. Uh, and uh, the telecom minister has said that a new version will be uh, brought uh, for consultation. And uh, we are expecting that it will continue to include uh, a combination of uh, mirroring and hard localization requirements. There are also a ton of sectoral policies. Uh, and you saw that in the previous slide that we have probably the second highest number of localization restrictions. Uh, and it began with the Reserve Bank of India in 2018. I mean, it began much earlier when telecom companies uh, were uh, required uh, to store data on subscribers and several other mandated security uh, transactions to hold data. But in 2018, Reserve Bank started this whole process of um, bringing in financial services data transactions into uh, into uh, domestic jurisdiction. So all of these sort of establish that India is not wanting to yet give up on um, holding a very strong position on uh, digital sovereignty and, uh, um, and, and having more control over the data. Now, what are some of the reasons that are driving this? So there are economic arguments like um, some of the speakers have already mentioned, and then there are security arguments. Mm -hmm. uh, and the economic arguments go along the lines of uh, fighting digital colonialism. India wants to take, this is an opportunity for India to sort of recreate its own digital economy, which it has been trying to do to fight the monopolization and dominance of big tech firms, um, uh, US, uh, Chinese, uh, uh, firms and and they fear that allowing for free flow of data would uh, 
slip away some of those negotiating powers and opportunities that they have for domestic companies. So, uh, so that's one. Remains to be tested, but that's uh, a space that they want to keep open. And the other is a very strong feeling that data localization and uh, data localization will help drive the growth of the domestic economy in terms of helping build the data center industry, uh, more infrastructure, more jobs, more innovation, and that this would create that inorganic push for the digital economy to, to grow. So uh, protectionist uh, measure in, in some sense. So these are the two economic arguments that are flowing in favor of data localization and the security arguments, given that we have a tense um, neighborhood very much like South Korea, and I'll come to that difference between Korea and India in a, in a little uh, while. But uh, and therefore, it makes uh, it important for India to also consider informational security, especially uh, when, as already discussed, the mutual legal assistance treaty and other forms of international cooperation uh, opportunities are are broken. So, securing access to data for law enforcement agencies become extremely important, and uh, that is one reason for them to. Uh, uh, to mandate data localization. Uh, also, the manner in which cybercrime and cyber attacks are being implemented, uh, a lot of cloud-based um, activities where the service providers or the hackers are not based on Indian soil, and therefore tracing them and getting to them also becomes a big challenge. So uh, both economic arguments and security arguments become uh, the driving force for India's current uh, position. But uh, having said this, at the same time, there is a recognition that um, a lot of this, that despite this, uh, a lot of the economic growth, uh, as well as international cooperation and reciprocity, would depend on India allowing uh, data free flows. And uh, therefore, uh, some softening or reconsiderations are, uh, are at least emerging, if, if not uh, making strong footholds yet. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, some research that uh, we did uh, and I was a part of, which established uh, the economic implications. This is based on an econometric model where we try to look at um, how free flow of data really uh, has an impact on uh, digital uh, trade. Uh, without going into the technicalities, what we were able to um, model using a standard gravity model of trade was to find that uh, a 10% increase in international inter internet bandwidth, which becomes a proxy for data flows, can lead to almost 7 billion US dollars uh, increase in volume of goods trade in India. And what that does amount to is almost 12% of India's total volume of trade could increase with increase in uh, uh, in internet bandwidth or uh, or data flow. So this is just an econometric ex exercise based on assumptions, but at least it tries to make the point which we went to the government with that even if you want to localize, we must you know we must know what we are losing. What are the costs of localizing? Is something that one must recognize. And here is here is one number for you to consider. A few. Uh, uh, I mean, you can in in the ballpark and uh, given errors of um, a given margin of errors, we we uh, we note that uh, any localization measure will have um, implications on on international trade, which is a great engine for uh, for the growth of the Indian economy. And then we sort of deep dive into uh, specific companies and specific sectors, trying to understand what are the opportunity costs of data localization, and this largely emerged from India's. Uh, very rapidly becoming policy of sectoral policies towards data localization. So we try to cut our sample across companies uh, in different sectors, across companies that uh, used their own servers versus used cloud-based servers for data processing and data storage. And we also covered them by size. So small companies versus big companies. And uh, we found that there is a continuum. It's not as if all companies are equally affected. And so if you're saying that everybody's going to be badly affected and the economy will have a shutdown, but what we found was it's not true. The small enterprises were, were really like in we don't care sort of zone. And it was um, the really big companies and also those big companies that were uh, of the multinational nature or belonging to the financial services, media and communication sector that were largely affected. And that was where the conversation was mostly happening. And again, evidence in terms of suggesting that if you're going to go this way, at least recognize that your policies may 
uh, have a disproportionate effect on certain industries. So be um, be cognizant of the fact that, you know, while you feel that data localization is only going to be good in terms of pushing uh, inorganic growth in some sense, um, there, there is also a huge cost that is coming to certain sectors and whether you can afford that cost on those sectors of the economy or not. So that was the purpose of uh, this exercise. Also, what you can see is that uh, not all of them uh, were really engaging in cross-border flow of data. So there were some that were and uh, and where the costs were very high, but then there were also some companies that were engaging in cross-border data flows, which said that, no, we can very quickly move to a localized regime. So even if we are currently sending data abroad or processing or storing data abroad, it's not going to be super difficult for us to do it in India. So on that, in that context also, it was, um, it was, uh, uh, it, there was a difference. So after having done all of this, and you know, it's it's really nice that everyone else has spoken before me. Is uh, when I was putting together slides and thinking of a way forward. I essentially thought that you know probably India is going to have something like a fourth model. And that it won't be all US and it's not going to be all EU and it's not going to be China and Russia. And uh, we we did uh, think about and the main the main problem is just contesting these value systems, right? Where the US is basically driven by uh, allowing free flow for its private companies, which are the you know which are the owners of uh, data. And then you have EU, which sits as uh, Professor Bari said. Uh, is is sitting and fundamentally based on protection of citizens' rights and everything sort of emanates from that. All, all the adequacy emanates from the fact that, uh, you know, there's privacy should be protected. And then you have China and Russia, which are more, which have the, which, where lens is more on informational security. Where is India? I we feel like India is like a little bit of everything. You know, they, they, they want... Uh, we don't even have a privacy bill, but privacy does, at least in all the discussions we've been having and listening to, privacy is important. Informational security, national security, extremely important. And the business and the industrial side is equally important. So I think we're going to see a model which is going to be a mix of these three. And one of the proposals um, that India made was looking at a data-oriented jurisdiction. And this was a part of, uh, this was a proposal they made to the ad hoc committee that is work working on international cybercrime, uh, where they said that they wanted a broader jurisdiction over citizen um, data. So it didn't matter where the data was stored or processed or screened, but uh, but if it was data belonging to Indian citizens, then they should have, uh, then the ownership rights would rest with the country. So. But I don't. We don't yet know whether this is going to see any traction. But that that's India's uh, proposal for the moment. Um, the other important thing I feel that is going to shape uh, India's conversations is on the role of the private sector, and we've seen it demonstrated in both Korea and Singapore in terms of how they are at least enabling domestic uh, uh, data sharing, and that has also translated into how they are approaching um, their their foreign uh, negotiations. So, despite similar sort of national security concerns in South Korea, um, we. Uh, th they are much more open to uh, data free flow with trust. For example, they were they are a part of Os the Osaka track, but India uh, abstained from it. Versus um, India uh, is still very domestically and government oriented. Uh, so that the India's data empowerment and protection uh, architecture, for instance, uh, largely focuses around what the government can do and, and government engagements, and not so much on um, how we can engage the private sector into this uh, model. Um, the final point is uh, what, you know, while everyone was talking about, you know, how do we get to an international agreement in, in my mind, I think we have to accept that, you know, it's going to be the world of the second best and that we probably may never land up with uh, an agreement, which everyone would agree to. And what would be this world of the second best? And we already have some examples and several uh, several examples have already been spoken about in the previous presentations. One is definitely to reform the MLAT. We already have um, a, a framework. It just needs to be strengthened. We need capacity building around it. We need uh, institutions to coordinate and make it more effective. Regional blocks such as the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation on Privacy, uh, the Budapest Con Convention on Cybercrime, again, um, 
something that both India and Korea have stayed away stayed away from for the moment, but an extremely effective framework to 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 not localize and yet solve uh, the access to data problem for law enforcement and uh, cyber crime. So, I, I I think there is a solution somewhere in the middle, which may not emanate from a complete global agreement on all of these issues. It, and, and to me, that's not pessimistic, really. It just seems more pragmatic. So I'll stop here and uh, look forward to any comments and feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kedia. That, that was uh, really interesting to get the, the perspective on, on India and, and the, uh, the frameworks that are emerging there. Uh, we've got two questions in the chat, which I'll put to you all, and then I'll um, put another question to you to try and close that discussion or simulate the discussion. Um, the first question is whether uh, it's particularly directed to you, Dr. Kedia, but, but also to the other speakers. Uh, and it's about the free flow of data. And the question is uh, the free flow of data and trust initiative. And the question specifically is why India didn't, didn't uh, sign up to that. And the more general question is whether other speakers consider it to have potential and whether it can be improved as a potential, potential model for the global free flow of data. So this is talking about the free flow of data and trust initiative. So that's the first question. The second question is whether, again, directed to all speakers, there are already examples of digital trade provisions that address cross-border cooperation on data spaces. Um, and we may have touched on that in the discussion earlier, but it'd be good to, to highlight that. So perhaps if we go to you first, Dr. Kelly, to talk on the Indian perspective and then open it up. Uh, thank you for the question. Well, I the reason India didn't sign is all the reasons that I spoke about in the presentation is that uh, they have a very strong position on wanting to protect uh, the opportunity they have to create uh, a homegrown digital economy uh, that is not dominated by American or Chinese uh, companies. And they feel that this is that uh, allowing for um, data localization and not allowing for cross-border free flow of data, despite having really benefited a lot from that uh, during the period of the IT revolution. I mean, that's how India really came to become uh, an IT giant in some sense. But in terms of digital, we didn't, we sort of missed that bus and here is our opportunity. And uh, so the economic lens is there. And the second is the, the national security lens, which also becomes important. And committing to anything at the G20 would mean that they have very little policy space to maneuver uh, domestically. And uh, I think, and, and, and that's the reason why it's not just the Osaka track or the G20, but any in any other multilateral forum, they have abstained from taking a position on um, data free flow. Uh, in fact, uh, and, 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 and only probably trying to break ice through uh, through bilateral agreements, which they are more comfortable with, or choose specific partners uh, with whom they feel that there is a big trade deal or there is an economic engagement that is worthwhile to reconsider their data governance policies around. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else want to offer an opinion on whether they think that, uh, this initiative is? Um, I, I mean, I think. Uh, Japan had the right idea, but never spelled it out. I actually have never heard of the Free Flow with Trust initiative. I understand what you're trying to say. I think all governments seek to, to build trust. As I said before, the problem is um, that basically they are trying to build trust among governments. I, I'm, I, I have Uh, yeah. Sorry, I, someone just called me. Um, I, I, but I, I do think you know that's inherently part of it. My view, as I've expressed in several scholarly articles, including one upcoming at Oxford International Review, the trust issue I mean, is, is very difficult because you really need to survey users to understand what makes them feel unsafe for that, that they don't trust the digital environment. And I don't think any trade agreement includes sufficient provisions that address their concerns. And again, in my mind, those concerns include censorship, harassment, disinformation, cyber theft, 
cyber manipulation. So let's be real here. How do you address cyber manipulation, as example, in the metaverse? Um, you know, I don't see any evidence policymakers are even talking about that. There are efforts to do this related to disinformation. The New Zealand government has been trying to get some common ground on cross-border data flows related to disinformation. In the United States, it's a real problem because it's viewed as censorship. Um, I'll let others speak. Maybe just to add something, I mean, this is a wonderful initiative, Data Flows with Trust, but it was never really filled with contents, you know, what, what exactly this means, and it hasn't found an institutional home yet. I mean, there have been, of course, the initiatives that are linked to the Joint Statement Initiative that uh, was talked uh, about, uh, but I mean, it's it's... Again, each country fills this with very different content. I, I don't think India is going to be under a lot of pressure if they sign to an initiative like this because it's it's a entirely of a sort of decoratory, uh, soft law nature. Um, I mean, for me, it's it's it would be best for India maybe to join RCEP because there are so many carve outs, so many policy space, and it would be actually relatively easy in terms of digital trade policy, notwithstanding the other issues, of course, that are part of this trade agreement to join. Um, but let's see. Yeah, I, I think I also agree with the uh, Mira, you know, and uh, others. Actually, the trust is a buzzy word, you know, and also this uh, G20, you know, trust, I mean, not only in data, in AI, any, you know, regulatory uh, framework will talk about trust. So it doesn't have a very concrete measures as well. And I think uh, most of the developing countries, including India, not only India, and African country, you know, and uh, they do not join the uh, the, the Africa, the Japanese uh, the initiative, not because of they do not want to have trust, but as um, um, Mansi just mentioned, it's more about uh, uh, autonomy, industry autonomy, national security concern, and uh, and all the other concerns. We really want to talk about the trust. So the 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 the, the G twenty agreement didn't address those concerns of the developing country. And also other countries, well, not only India. So trust is not the the core. I think that's the main answer. Thank you. Can I add something to this? Um, which is basically trust is impossible to measure, right? Uh, we do use proxies, but to me, proxies are extremely dangerous. Um, for example, logically, I don't understand how broadband is any way, shape, or form a proxy for cross-border data flows. Um, the only way to measure cross-border data flows, in my mind, like trust, is to, you could try to measure the corruption, the counterweight, um, so what are trust-building things, but, um, you know, when we rely on proxies, which is the dilemma here, because we're not directly able to measure the actual flow, um, or to measure trust, and I'm 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 not dissing um, your report, but I I just think it's a dangerous place, right? So we really don't have the information we need to like say this builds trust or this doesn't build trust because again, it's not something that you can measure. Um, but I do think the effort to try to do it is a is a good idea. Thank you. Um, to try to build trust. You have a question, a response. Sorry, Mansi, did you have your hand up? Did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to sort of add that, uh, you know, on the G20, uh, the not, not uh, becoming a part of the data free flow with trust, like everyone said, I don't think it was, it, it was a substance, but it was more about the signal that countries wanted to put in place about whether or not they were on the negotiating table. So everyone's absolutely right in terms of there not being enough substance uh, on, um, on how that free flow would happen, but more in terms of a signal whether or not they were, um, th they were ready or th they were willing or open to the idea of uh, free flow of data. So I, I just wanted to sort of clarify that. Thank you. So I'm just conscious of time. We've got another question, which was the question about uh, examples of digital trade provisions that address cross-border cooperation. And I know, uh, Mira, you dealt with some, and also, uh, Yip Chan, you've, you've identified various agreements. Um, is there anything you'd like to add to that question? 
I think uh, in there's a transatlantic, uh, you know, framework, privacy framework. So this is we uh, is uh, and the other one is uh, I just mentioned is the uh, ASEC, in the Asia Pacific uh, corporations. They have this uh, privacy framework as well, which is regional. But uh, American just uh, American and just expanded uh, to a global initiatives. And as a, a kind of you know corporations interoperational ability mechanisms, but the problem with that, as I said, you know, the, 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 this Asia, uh, the Asia Pacific the CPAR framework has been criticized, which is uh, to facilitate uh, particular countries' interests, uh, and also to exclude it, you know, some other countries as well. So all these uh, regional operational. Um, into operation, uh, uh, operational mechanism as kind of the, you know, because it's a regional trade bo uh, block based. So it's always have a kind of exclusions, you know, uh, issues as well. Okay, excellent. So just to close it, I've got a question for all the panelists, just, just very quickly um, of you. So I think going back to the sort of overarching question that we were focused on this session, I, I think we've all, seen that there's some value in cross-border data sharing. I mean, Manzestad was very clear in the digital trade benefits to, to India by 2030. Um, and also that there's opportunity costs of data localization and the potential digital divide. But we've also identified various um, barriers and blockages uh, to getting cross-border uh, cooperation on data sharing. We've also spoken about future risks of not taking account of changes in technology. And Suzanne's presentation was very good on that. Um, so I think the view is that something needs to happen. Um, and in the discussion, I think there were three potential models or trajectories were presented. One, uh, which came out, I think, particularly in your presentation, Mira, was the, the idea of having the CPTPP uh, chapter and the EU template uh, evolving, perhaps in tension with each other. Another model was uh, Yves Chan's model of the WTO as a thin agreement. And then Manzi's uh, discussion at the end spoke about the UN ad hoc committee on, um, on data oriented jurisdiction within the international cyber crime chapter. Uh, so my question to all of you then is, of those three models or trajectories that, we, that, that came out of the discussion, which do you think is more desirable? Which do you think is more likely? And is there any other option? So perhaps we could start, uh, if anyone wants, well, it's, I'll leave the floor open if anybody wants to go first, otherwise we'll, Go through or each channel. I'll give you the first. Okay, so I I personally prefer the WTO model because, as I said, you know, WTO model is more beneficial to the uh, developing country and the less developed countries because they have to because each have a more equally participate and uh, also the J the, the the new initiatives you know although uh, South Africa and uh, and uh, India and uh, uh, reject it. We take it because as uh, they, they already uh, Manson already gave the reason, you know, be, because basically they do not have this want to have agreement on the on the, the policy restriction on the uh, on the on the restriction. They do not have a policy on free flow. They want to allow the country, you know, to have a restriction on data. So that's the reason they reject it. But uh, if there's a thin agreement, as I said, which can accommodate, you know, a different. Uh, uh, cultural and these and also uh, domestic public interest policy, public policy and the national security exceptions in a thin and the contextual context, which would be good for developing country, less developed countries. So, so this is my preference, okay? But uh, realistically, I think it, the, the, the progress will be very slow and uh, and uh, we will see in the middle, uh, short and middle term, we will see a kind of regional and the parallel universal. The worst, I think the worst is a parallel universal, which has a, you know, the, 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 the power struggling between the US and China and Russia and the Indian. It's kind of parallel, you know, a trade system. So that is the worst case. But in the middle, probably is the regional agreements with some interoperational, you know, mechanism. So yeah, that's my perceptions. Thank you. Anybody else? Does anybody else want to offer a view on? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I I think the models that you outlined, they're not necessarily in contestation, and they're going to happen all in a sense. You know, um, I think. We are going to continue with this very fragmented framework, it's, and it's going to become even denser, I think, in a sense, you know, more fragmented, but also denser, where countries realize 
that there is definitely a sort of a need, an enhanced need for international cooperation um, in this new data-driven economy. And we see this a little bit in our initiatives on interoperability of open government data, on digital identities, on uh, AI frameworks. Um, so that is moving a little bit, uh, very slowly, of course. And then we're going to have perhaps a very thin agreement coming from the World Trade Organization, which still is going to be beneficial, you know, for enabling digital trade, not necessarily solving all those sort of data issues, but still giving some legal certainty and uh, opportunities for businesses, including in, in developing countries, as, as it was mentioned. So I think it, it's just going to be a lot of work for us as lawyers and political scientists. There's going to be a lot of research to do. <laughs> Thank you. Nancy, did you want to say something? Yeah, I, I sort of completely agree with uh, what Mira is saying. I think uh, these are going to evolve parallelly. And I feel like it's probably a better way for it to evolve. It's going to be more organic where countries choose to, um, uh, choose to. Uh, I mean, they pick and choose what, what models. But I think what it will also do, as it eventually does in, in the case of several other global governance issues, whether it is climate or cybersecurity or trade, as it has been historically, there's always some sort of convergence that emerges. And, you know, there, there eventually will be an organically determined governance model that more or less all countries would be uh, comfortable with some version of it, and that that could be an exception in one or two countries which are, are opposed, which are opposed to that idea. But um, but I think we should just we should allow for different models to evolve, um, and for countries to choose from those models instead of trying to force or drive or, or or for policymakers or for anyone to actually say that no, this is the best model. I don't think that is the best model. I think the the model that works for a country is the best model. So um, I, I I would completely agree with the others that we should uh, we should let everything uh, evolve parallelly and wait for things to unfold. Okay, thank you, Suzanne. Did you want to make a comment on this? Well, I think data flows. You know, data is exchanged. There's often no transaction involved, so is it really the right place to govern it under trade? That's where the action has been. I would hate to abandon it, but I think there are legitimate questions. But uh, I think because we rely on the exceptions instead of coming up with clear rules, which I know is understandable, um, that result means that nations decide for themselves as opposed to, and you know, await a, a trade dispute, which is very rare. Um, when they do things that could appear to violate market access or, you know, other norms of the WTO. So should we start afresh by creating, as my colleagues at CG say, a data stability board? I, I don't know the right answer <laughs> to all that, but I, I feel like the WTO is incapable of dealing with these issues um, multilaterally, and that's why you know, it would be good to see something building on, for example, DEPA, um, which I think takes a more flexible approach, but honestly, I don't know, and I'll leave it to all these brilliant people to, to make a better choice. Excellent, thank you. Um, Okay, well, that, that's that's very useful, I think, for, uh, to close out the discussion and uh, to hear the view that you know, no, no particular model is is we should advocate for, and um, in a sense, uh, let them develop uh, as they do and, and and sort it out. I mean, I suppose the issue there is one of time. Yeah. And if we're talking years or decades, and the potential opportunity cost of that period, but nevertheless, uh, it's probably better than imposing a model that nobody signs up to. Thank you very much, Iran, for, for your taking the time today. I found that really interesting. It's been very useful. Um, and I think fantastic to get these different perspectives um, from everyone um, around the world on, on, on what's happening in their countries and also uh, how they think a governance framework can evolve. So thank you again for your time. And um, I hope to see you again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you, thank you so much. Yeah.